Lord, we thank you tonight for your goodness. We thank you for your grace. Thank you, dear God, for the power of the Holy Spirit of God. And Lord, I pray that at this time, Lord, that you cover this assembly with your blood. I pray, Lord, that you rebuke any unclean spirit, anything that would exalt itself against you, anything that would hinder the work of the Holy Spirit here tonight. And God, I pray that you would speak to our hearts, Lord. I pray that you'd enlighten our minds, God, and I pray that you'd make us aware of those things, that, Lord, you've told us about in the Scripture, that we might stand <coughs> steadfast for you, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Turn with me tonight, if you would, to the book of Romans, chapter number 7. <clears throat> Romans chapter number 7, and starting down in verse number 14. Romans chapter 7, verse number 14. The Bible says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that, I, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. Mm -hmm. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God for Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. What we see described here is the conflict I think that we all feel. And I heard your assent to that tonight. We, we all feel this, we all experience this, but the fact is we don't always all perceive what's going on. We don't always understand what's happening. In other words, it happens to us, but we don't always know what's going on when it's happening to us. And that's because we're more familiar with the physical. The physical is called the carnal here. It means the same thing. It means that which is of the flesh, material things. And so we look for a physical source of our discontentment. Mm -hmm. Why am I unhappy? Why am I unsatisfied? There's got to be some physical reason for it. We look for who to blame for our frustrations. We look for a carnal reason for what went wrong. That's our natural disposition is to default to the physical, to the carnal. But we're less familiar with and more vulnerable to the spiritual. And so we read there that the law is spiritual, but we are carnal. And we read, to will is present with me, but how to perform it, I find none. And we read, when I would do good, evil is present with me. And we read that I delight in God, but there's another law in my members warring against the law of my mind. And with my mind I serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. So we all have that conflict, and we all experience that, that contrast or that that confrontation between spiritual and carnal, but a lot of times we don't really understand what's going on. And our default reaction, typically, is to look for the carnal reason, the, the physical, the, the person, the problem, uh, you know, that sort of thing, the carnal reason with what went wrong. And that's the battle that we fight, and we all have that conflict within us. Now, our greatest vulnerability is when the spiritual compounds the things that we are experiencing physically. So it's not to say we don't have a physical problem, or that there's not mental stress, or that there's not emotional duress. Those things could in fact exist, that, that carnal side of things, the physical, the mental, the emotional, can, can in fact exist. But when our greatest vulnerability is when the spiritual gets added on to the carnal when we're facing a conflict with both of those things. And the fact is that we, and I say we are not just as Christians, but humanity, we are weak at perceiving the spiritual connotations of things. 
because by default it's not something you can see or necessarily hear or touch or or whatever we, we are weak at seeing and being able to understand oh, okay hold on there's a spiritual component to this let me give you some examples you're familiar with this story in, in John chapter 3 Jesus tells Nicodemus he must be born again how's Nicodemus respond what am I supposed to do get back into my mother's womb and be born and Jesus said no 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 and but isn't that our reaction right <laughs> Our reaction is, I don't get it, because we're immediately thinking physical. And it's not just unbelievers, and I'll say that Nicodemus was an unbeliever, he was seeking, but he was an unbeliever at that time, but it's also those who follow Christ. Look with me at Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, verse number 6. Matthew 16, verse number 6. Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It's because we have taken no bread. We forgot to bring lunch. They missed the whole spiritual application of that. Look down at verse number 11. Jesus said, How is it that you do not understand that I spake it not to you concerning bread, that you should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Then understood they how he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Isn't that, that's us, right? Oh, now I get it. But our default is like, oh, we forgot lunch, <laughs> right? Uh, look at Luke chapter 9 and verse 52. In Luke chapter 9, verse, well, let's, you go to verse 54, and I'll give you some context there in verse 52. Jesus' disciples <laughs> here in Luke 9, 52, are going into a city of the Samaritans to prepare the way before him. And that is, they're, they're getting ready to say, hey, Jesus is coming to town. Where can we meet? When are you, how many of you would like to come and hear Jesus? But it says the city didn't want to receive him. And so in Luke 9, and verse 54, it says, when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias, that's Elijah of the Old Testament, did? But he, Jesus, turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. They were saying, Jesus, they don't want to receive you. Let's scorch them. <laughs> and Jesus said, No, you've got the wrong spirit there. That's not my spirit. Look again at John chapter 14. John chapter 14, and I've, I've brought this up before. Uh, in other contexts, but I'm just trying to illustrate to you how that oftentimes uh, we mistake and, and we see only the physical, the carnal side of things, and we miss the whole spiritual component. And we do that as believers. These are disciples of Christ. And so John 14, verse 9, uh, Jesus saith unto him, that's to Philip here in the context, Have I been so long time with you, and yet thou hast not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? All this time, Philip has been a disciple and a, and a follower of Jesus Christ. And, and Jesus is essentially saying, if I can say it respectfully and kind of paraphrase, why don't you get it? Uh, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. How can you not know this? But we have a problem with spiritual perception. Mm -hmm. And there's other examples in the Bible, the New Testament, but you get the idea. We don't have a problem identifying the obvious physical problem. What was the obvious physical problem? We forgot to bring bread. We didn't bring lunch. That's not usually our problem. Yes, we can get forgetful, but we quickly identify the physical carnal problem on that side of things. We might even figure out the psychological profile of, uh, you know, hey, they rejected what we stand for and what we believe in. Let's scorch them, <laughs> right? You know, they, they rejected you, Jesus. They deserve to be, uh, uh, you know, roasted with fire. So psychologically, we might be able to kind of figure things out. Carnally, we kind of figure things out. But our weakness is in spiritual perception. It's understanding the spiritual conflict, the spiritual opposition, the spiritual warfare that's affecting our situation. We see things happen, and what do we do? We blame others. Or we blame the circumstances. I can't believe this happened to me. Some of you said that this week. I know what somebody did. Uh, blame, we blame bad luck. We blame God for allowing it to happen. God, why are you persecuting me? Why did you let this happen? But we seem to forget that we have an invisible enemy who masquerades 
as all kinds of things to subvert us away from the only things that will protect us and preserve us. The very things that will make us stronger and protect us and preserve us, his goal and his aim is to subvert us away from those things into a place in an area of weakness. He lures us into what seems like better options, what seems like a better choice than just trusting God. Say, how do you know? Come on, Genesis chapter 3. Yea, hath God said, ye shall not surely die. He knows that you will be as gods, knowing good and evil. And look how pleasant this is, and to be desired and good for food. And they took it. And they took it. He said, oh man, what'd they do that for? Why do we do it? Right. Because we're unaware of this spiritual subversion that just gently leads us off into the wrong area. The adversary sows confusion. He sows contradiction. And he sows chaos. All without our knowledge. He doesn't show up and say, I'm here to bring chaos. He's not that little guy on that commercial, you know? I'm here to sow chaos. He's, he's, not that, he's not that obvious. It's all just kind of under the radar. And if we're not paying attention, we don't understand. It's not so easily seen as, you're the problem. I got a problem with you, but who's manufacturing that problem with him, right? Who's, who's provoking that reaction to things? So the confusion and the contradiction and the chaos come most of the time without our knowledge, and those things weaken us, and they subvert us to make some bad decisions. Just like in Genesis chapter 3, just like, you look, hey, David made bad decisions with bad sheep. I mean, how many times, you know the stories of the Bible. People made bad decisions because they were subverted by the enemy. So right now, right now, things are happening in your life. You say, well, I'm not aware of it. I know. <laughs> and that's the problem. Things are happening in your life <clears throat> that are a result of a quiet subversion and exploiting our weaknesses and compounding our reaction to things. So you say, no, no, I have this real problem. Okay, but the spiritual component is to add on to that, to add weight to that, to add pain to that, to cause us to react in an improper and an ungodly way. And right now, those things are happening. So we don't handle opposition of life correctly. And all we see is the physical pain or the physical problem. That's, that's what we usually see and identify first. We see the person who is the source of our frustration or our injustice. We see the carnal symptoms of what has become a spiritual battle, but we're just not really tuned in to the spiritual part of it. And so we become not only blind to the spiritual truths and the warnings of the God's word, but we become truly ignorant of the subversion of a spiritual enemy who is there to destroy us, who is unseen, who is quiet, who is subversive and against God. Uh, our enemy is an opportunist. Say, so how do you know that? Because the Bible says he's got a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. A lion does not attack a herd of animals or prey uh, that are in a position of strength. They're looking for weakness. They're looking for vulnerability. They're looking for separation. And they're looking, he's looking for the same things in you. He's an opportunist who wants to devour anything, any sign of weakness, any sign of vulnerability. He wants to exploit that. He wants to add on to that so that he can draw you away from God. So he can't directly consume a child of God. He says, but seeking whom he may devour, but he can't devour you. He can't outright consume you. He can't take you to hell. He can't destroy you. So he attacks an unattended wound in our spirit. I want you to stop and think about that. He attacks an unattended wound in our spirit. I'm hurting. I feel wounded. I, I, I've been offended. I've been hurt. He's just going to dig right in there and attack that wound. He exploits the unguarded desire of our carnal flesh. We have a weakness. We have a tendency that 
the Bible says the sin which does so easily beset us. We all have things that, that are more of a temptation. We are more personally vulnerable to than other people might be. It's our personal weakness. and It's our kryptonite. It's our vulnerability. But that's exactly where he's going to attack. That unguarded weakness of desire. He's going to set a snare to trip us up by our own carelessness. Just by not paying attention, a snare is by nature something that is not easily seen, it's disguised. And so you, we fall into those things, we trip over those things because we have become unguarded and, and, and careless. He drives a wedge into any little fracture between us or other people and God. He, just, he loves to just split families apart, split friends apart, split churches apart. Keep you apart from God. Have you get you know, some little root of bitterness growing within you? Some some kind of a thing that has that has just come in there, and and and, and it might be a legitimate thing, but understand you have a spiritual enemy that's going to exploit that yeah. to get you to react in a wrong way, yeah. and, to, and you say, "But I deserve." That's exactly what he wants you to believe. Rather than handling it right and handling it God, and he takes that, that wound, that unattended wound, that unguarded desire, that snare that we don't see, and he drives wedges in there just to split and divide and to push things apart. But we don't see that. And it's not because you as an individual are stupid or lesser than others. It's simply because that's the nature of our enemy. And we all face that, and every one of us has a weakness in being able to perceive that, hey, am I really understanding and addressing the spiritual component of this? Now, if you watch the movies, and listen, if you want to understand the Bible, don't go to the movies, amen? <laughs> but if you watch the movies, they will have you believe that the, that the devil shows up and, you know, with horror. It's, you know, the chainsaws and the sabers and the, and, and the, the, the uh, machetes, and he shows up with horror in some sort of a scary, overwhelming assault against our physical being. I'm going to choke you. I'm going to make you bleed. I'm going to dismember you. That's what's in the movie, right? That's what people expect, the confrontation of the devil. You know, it's, it's Lord Vader, you know, I'm going to, and you're going to levitate and choke to death and all that kind of stuff. That's not how it works. The truth is he often shows up masquerading as an angel of light. And he, you know, I'm here to help you. I want to help you feel better about yourself. That's the line. That's how he comes in to deceive and subvert <coughs> us away from God. How do I know that? 2 Corinthians 11, 14 says, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness. It's not like it is in the movies. It's subtle. It's subversive. It's, it's something that we don't even see and perceive most of the time. And so what we need to do is quit fixating on the obvious physical component. Amen. I'm not talking about living in denial. Those things are there. The physical hurts, the mental stress, the emotional duress, those things are all very real. But we need to quit fixating on this is my problem, you're my problem, that thing is my problem. And we need to let God show us that less obvious <coughs> spiritual component that's contributing to things as well. Now just look at Luke, or Matthew 16 again, if you would, just to show you how blind we can be to spiritual subversion. Say, not me, I'm a great Christian. Mm. Well, would, would you agree that the Apostle Peter was a great Christian? Mm. After all, he was the first pope. How, how much better could he be, <laughs> But Matthew chapter 16, let's see, let's see just how blind we can be to spiritual subversion. Matthew 16, verse 21, From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Why must he do that? Because that was the prophecy. He must fulfill. Those things must happen. Verse 22, Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he, Jesus, turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou art an offense unto me. Look, what, what, how, did that come, how did it come to that situation? For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Mm -hmm. 
Peter, in his uh, human innocence, whatever you want to call it, no, Lord, I don't want you to suffer and die. We love you. We can all identify with that, right? Amen. But he's not seeing. He doesn't even perceive how he is being manipulated, yeah. how his speech and his sentiments are being manipulated. And so Jesus identifies it and says, get thee behind me, Satan. You say, who's he? he's talking to Peter, who is being manipulated by the wicked one. And he said, thou savest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. So I honestly believe that Peter probably had no idea that he was being manipulated there. He probably felt like he was doing the right thing. He cared about Jesus. But we can be so blind to the spiritual things because we're not that spiritual. We're physical. We're material. And that's what we deal with most of the time. And so those kind of things are happening right now in our daily lives. You say, oh, not to me. Yeah, to you. <coughs> to you. And, you know, there's some times that uh, the Lord will show me some things as a preacher, and I can see it, and I'll say, yeah, that's, that's just spiritual exploit. There's other things. There's real things and real problems and real issues, but there's a spiritual component that's not even being recognized. And it happens in my life. And so then we have to try to catch up, if you will. And those things are happening in our daily lives, and the enemy wants nothing more than to subvert us. What does subvert? It means to get us out of the path, get us away from God, away from each other, away from anything that will make us strong or effective and fruitful for God. He wants to subvert. It's so like, we're going this way. I'm following God. I'm going to do this. He just wants to subvert. Why? Because he can't destroy you. You're already saved. Amen. You're redeemed. You're safe in Jesus Christ. Amen. He cannot destroy you, so he wants to subvert you. And so, those things don't just happen to a child, of, just, just a child of God. You say, well, if I wasn't a Christian, I wouldn't be so persecuted. No, these things happen to all people. That's right. That's right. It happens to unsaved people. The only difference is, as a child of God, we can spot what's happening. Mm -hmm. And we can stand against it. An unsaved person has no defense at all except their carnal mind and their carnal will. Mm -hmm. Whatever self-discipline and personal character they might have. Now listen, some, some people who are, who are unsaved are very strong in their natural restraint. They're very controlled, disciplined people, and that's good for them. But they're not equipped to deal with anything spiritually. Mm -hmm. I mean, spiritually, they're just victims. So you say, well, uh, it's just because I followed <clears throat> Jesus and now I've made myself a victim. No, you've always been a victim. Right. But before, you were just going with the tide. Yeah. <laughs> before, you did, had no awareness, you had no ability to stand against it. Now you do. Yeah. Now you have the ability to stand with God. So as a child of God, we still cannot trust our carnal mind and our willpower. We, we can't just go in, that's Acts chapter 7. We can't, we can't go in there and say, oh, I know how to handle this. I'm a Christian. I'm going to command it to be done. And say, like, who are you? <laughs> we, don't, we don't enter into that arena by our personal mental acuity and, and our willpower. We say, what's mental acuity? Well, if you don't know that, you definitely don't want to try to battle the devil that way. The only way we can survive is to shelter under the wings of Almighty God. Jesus said to Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered thee as a hen gathered thee under his wings, but you would not. The only way is to say, God, shelter me. Well, you read all through the Psalms, Lord, be my refuge, my strength, my rock, my high tower. The only way we can survive is to get under the shelter of God's wings and to care carefully follow his voice. Not the voice in your head, <laughs> the voice on the page in front of you. And the voice of the Holy Spirit that confirms the word of God. Thank God we have a, like I was just saying to my wife the other day, uh, I was trying to log on to my bank account, you know, and it's like, oh, we sent you a text. Can you verify that it's really you? It's like, it was me last time I logged on from this computer. But everything is double authentication, right? Well, you have double authentication as a Christian. The Bible's been way ahead of that for centuries and centuries. You have the written, preserved words of God, and you have the Holy Spirit of God within you to bear witness to that, and then if, when they're both in agreement, you and I can have confidence. Amen. So how do we survive in the spiritual battle? We don't even understand what's going on half the time. Well, first of all, we need to shelter under God's almighty wings. Secondly, we need to carefully follow his voice in the darkness. 
Because sometimes we're just walking through the darkness. And then thirdly, we need to resist the appetites and the attitudes of sin that the enemy appeals to. In other words, don't feed your weakness. Resist the appetites and the attitudes of our flesh, which the devil appeals to. Our enemy is malicious. He's relentless. He is without compassion and without mercy. If, if we show sign of weakness, like, oh, I'll, I'll just back off, I'll just, I'll just back away, then you're just asking for more problems. You're asking for more pressure. He wants to discourage. He wants to destroy. He wants to drive wedges that will fracture the very things that make us stronger. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever seen this, but I, 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 you know, I see these random videos that show up from time to time. And I saw this guy, and, and he's uh, got a, a rock that's like three times the size of him. And he's going to split this rock. And I'm like, yeah, right. And I'm thinking, what's he going to do, drill a hole and put dynamite or whatever? No, he went around and he found a small crack, a fracture, and he put a wedge in there. And he began to pound on that wedge and pound on that wedge. And as that thing widened, he got another wedge, and he just kept, just kept exploiting that fracture and that line mm -hmm. and just kept driving those wedges. Do you hear what I'm saying tonight? Just keep driving those wedges. Oh, they don't care about you. They're not right. They're not even concerned. Look at how malicious they are. They didn't even pay attention. They didn't even call you back. They Wedges, wedges, wedges. I saw how they looked at me. I heard what they said. I know what they meant by that. Wedges, wedges, wedges. And some of the biggest boulders, three times the size of a man, can be split by a bunch of wedges and one man that just keeps pounding away. And that's what our enemy does with us. He wants to discourage. He wants to destroy. He wants to drive those wedges. <clears throat> you know, there's three basic reasons why bad things happen in our life. Now, you ought to be excited. If you're a writer down, you ought to write these ones down. There's three basic reasons why we have struggles, why we have challenges, why we face opposition and adversity. And you're going to love this first one. Number one is sometimes because of our stupidity. You say, that's offensive. Come on, let's just be honest. Yeah, How many of you have ever done something stupid and go, oh, why did I do that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and the rest of you are dishonest. <laughs> Sometimes bad things happen because of our stupidity. What do I mean by that? Because of our weakness. Because of our ignorance. Because of our carelessness. You say, but I didn't know. I know. That, that's, by definition, part of what it means, our stupidity. We just did not understand. We didn't fully consider. We were careless. We, sometimes, let's just be honest, it's our fault. And it's our stupidity. Sometimes, it's because of our stubbornness. And I say specifically, our stubbornness with against God. Our stubbornness is it, like it's going to be our way instead of God's ways. Our stubbornness. Like, I'm going to hold on, and I'm going to be right. And people are going to know that I'm right. And, and, and God is ultimately right, but I know that I'm right, and I'm going to be right. Sometimes the cause of our problem is our own stupidity and ignorance. Sometimes our problem is our stubbornness. And at other times, our problem is the subversion of the enemy. That one who comes in there silently and attacks and drive wedges and trips and snares and we're blind to it until we've already become a victim mm. and really that 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 really kind of covered it's not flattering i i understand that i that is not a part of the message that just strokes your ego and makes you know let's make a video clip out of that one and put a reel on <laughs> the internet right but honestly there's three basic reasons why we have problems and troubles and struggles in our life sometimes it's because of our stupidity Sometimes because of our stubbornness, and sometimes it's because of we've been subverted by the enemy. If we're victims of the first reason, that is our own <coughs> stupidity, then we need to quit trying to do it ourselves. You know, if, if you think about I've used the illustration often, but as a young child, they get that confidence, I can do this myself, I can try, and then they fall, or they hurt themselves, and it's like, you know, they lose, well, quit trying to do it yourself. You're not ready for it yet. Quit trying to do it yourself. Listen to counsel, learn, and find God's plan for your life. If it's just our ignorance and carelessness, 
then we need to learn better. We need to grow a little more. We need to become a little bit stronger. We need to listen. We need to learn. And we need to find God's counsel on things. And if we're victims of the second reason, that is our stubbornness against God, we need to quit chasing our flesh. What does that mean? Quit chasing the things that appeal to our immediate carnal desires and give us that immediate carnal gratification and live by principle and by the precepts of the word of God and saying, if this is right and God said it's right, I'll wait and let him bless me for it later, but I'm not going to seek this, this carnal uh, satisfaction right now. Quit chasing your flesh and quit fighting God. If, if you are facing, if you're facing difficulty because of stubbornness against God, then you've got to quit fighting with God. Quit arguing with him. Quit saying, God, I want this to happen now, and you're not making it happen now. And, and all these things that we do, quit fighting God, quit chasing the flesh, learn to trust him, and truly follow him. That's how we have victory over stubbornness. I said how we have victory over stupidity, how we have victory over stubbornness. And if we're victims for the third reason, that is the subversion of the enemy, then the Bible tells us this, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. We need to resist him. Don't show weakness. Don't show uh, a fear. God's not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. Not confidence in ourselves, confidence in him. Amen. But resist the devil. Resist his efforts. Resist his constant onslaught. If he just keeps pushing the same button every time, we need to learn if he's going to keep pushing that button. As long as we keep responding, he's going to keep pushing that button. So quit, uh, resist the devil and quit feeding the flesh and the mind that give him strength. In other words, you know, you think about this. If, if I have diabetes, which I don't, thank God. But if I have diabetes and I just go around loading up on Twinkies and Ho-Hos and donuts and all that kind of stuff, what, I am causing my own problem. I am feeding the very thing which is destructive to me. If somebody has cancer, they've been not diagnosed with lung cancer, to go out there and, and, and continue smoking cigarettes and doing all that kind of stuff, it's just contributing to what was already destroying you. So don't feed the things that are feeding disease and pain and, and, and weakness physically, but don't do that spiritually. If something's making you weak spiritually, if something's causing pain and agitation and frustration and, and insecurity spiritually, quit feeding that. Quit giving him something to build on as he wants to bring you pain and resist the devil. So I'm not suggesting that it's easy. I'm not suggesting it's easy. I'm not suggesting it's a one-time solution. But here's why the Bible said in 1 Peter 5 and verse 9, be sober, that's serious, but don't be drunk either. <clears throat> be sober, serious, be vigilant, always watchful, aware, careful, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith. In the fa this is what God wants. This is what God said. No. What did Jesus say when he was tempted of the devil? Well, it is written. It is written again. It is written. It is written. It is written. It is written. He was calling upon the promises of God, knowing the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. It's not just you. You're not the only one facing it. We all face the same adversity, but as a child of God, we can spot it. And we can put some armor on to protect ourselves. You do know Ephesians chapter 6, right? The whole armor of God. You say, you're going to pray. No, I preached that one before. You can read. Go back and read it again. We can spot and say, oh, wait a minute, I see what else is happening here. Yes, Andre is a problem. <laughs> but, but he's not, I love picking on him. But he's not the only problem. There's a spiritual thing happening here yeah. too. So you can spot it, you can put some armor on, and then you can withstand the attack. But you have to resist. If we continue to focus only on the carnal and the physical, then we will continue to be victims of spiritual exploitation of our weakness. Whatever weakness we have, we can, be, we can be in a place of emotional duress and we can be weak that way. We can be mentally, cha not cha mentally challenged, mentally, uh, mentally stressed 
and, and having, you know, just wrestlings in our mind, confused, right? Depressions, things like that. And he will exploit that. We can have physical things. Anything from, from loss to trauma to, to ill health to, you know, all kinds of things that can happen. Uh, somebody that you care for a long time in the hospital. Those are all things that our enemy would love to get in and just exploit those things and use it to pile on. So I should make one thing clear. A Christian cannot be possessed. A Christian cannot be possessed by another spirit that is contrary to the Holy Spirit of God within us. The Holy Spirit is not going to be displaced or overcome by any other spiritual adversary. But we can be influenced. Peter was. We can be manipulated if we yield ourselves to those things. So it's a matter. So here's what happens: the the devil presents the op the option to sin, but we're the ones that have to yield to that and yield our will to that. So we read in Romans chapter six and verse thirteen: Neither yield ye your your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Verse 16 says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom you obey. You cannot be controlled. Amen. You cannot be possessed. Amen. by it. You are possessed by the Spirit of God. Amen. That's it. <clears throat> but you can be manipulated. That option can be put in front of you so that if you choose, you say, oh, but I didn't see it as a, as a, I know, because we're blind to that so many times. And we yield ourselves. So his servants, ye are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. So we can't be controlled. You say, well, if we can't be controlled, how does it work? How do, how do so many Christians get subverted? How did I get subverted? Well, look with me at, the, at a few scriptures here quickly. First Chronicles 21 and verse number 1. It's not the open confrontation. It's not the scary horror. It's First Chronicles 21 and verse 1. And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. If you know that story, that numbering of Israel had a very bad outcome because he yielded to being provoked. So you have an adversary that at various stages and in various ways is looking to take, look up here for a moment, he's looking to take what exists in your life as a natural stress and problem and provoke you with that. He's looking to take a stick of pain, take it from your hand and beat you with it. He's looking to provoke you. Look at Acts chapter 5 and verse number 3. You say, how does it work if I can't be possessed? Well, just like it worked with Peter. Didn't even realize it was happening. Sometimes we're provoked. Sometimes we have something like this happen, Acts chapter 5 and verse 3. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? So he lied, and he, he was dishonest about what he was representing. Why did that happen? Because Satan filled his heart. What does that mean? It means that there was a seed planted, and that was allowed to stay there. And then there was something else, and you considered it. And you didn't filter it through the Word of God. And you say, no, that's not right, and you didn't cast that out. And, it just, and after a while, your heart got full. And, and Ananias came convinced I can look spiritual like everybody else and say, I'm bringing the whole price of the land and nobody's going to know, but he was lying to the Holy Ghost and he was subverted because his heart got filled bit by bit by bit, consideration. Let's just kind of contemplate that. Well, maybe it won't be so bad. I wonder if I could get away with it. Will anybody else know? I'll only tell my wife. How'd that work out? Mm. Right? So sometimes we are provoked, sometimes Satan fills the heart. Look at Mark chapter 8, verse 33. Mark chapter 8, verse 33, and this is a co counterpart to Matthew 16, but it bears mentioning again, uh, verse 33 of Mark chapter 8. 
And when he had turned about and looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. When our values become more focused on what's important carnally than they are being faithful and true to God, then we're, we're about to be exploited. In Revelation chapter 12, and verse 9 and verse 10, we read this, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. It's almost never that direct confrontation. It's a deception. It's a snare. Verse 10 says, For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. He is looking for a place or a way to excuse you, accuse you rather, and, and to deceive you, pardon me, into getting away from God. That's what's going on. It's subtle. It's subversive. It's not confrontational and obvious. Those, those things that are a carnal part of our life, the, the personality conflicts, the frustrations of, of poor communication, the things didn't work out, and I'm hurting, and I don't like this. Those are obvious and easy to identify. Those confrontations are carnal, but the spiritual part is a little bit harder to, to observe. It's subtle, it's subversive, it's deceptive, and setting you up for a fall. He is the accuser of the brother. He wants to set you up and trip you up so that you fall. It's focusing on the carnal values of men and not what God values. It's allowing our heart to be filled with motives contrary to God. It's allowing ourselves to be provoked to actions that God cannot be pleased with. And if you want to continue to struggle, just keep looking for a carnal solution. Just keep looking for somewhere to point your finger of blame, looking for somewhere to point, uh, to identify a person or a thing or whatever. Keep looking for a carnal solution and you'll continue to struggle. Sometimes it's just our stupidity. And if it's our stupidity, then maybe the fix is physical. And we just need to do smarter and, 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 and do more what we should do. If it's stubbornness, then who do you think, if it's stubbornness against God, who do you think is provoking that? Who do you think is telling you God's not being fair and God doesn't care about you and God's not blessing you like he should? If it's subversion of the enemy, then we need to put on the armor of God. And what will bring us down is what brought David down. It's what brought Peter down. Great men of God, not even realizing the spiritual component that was exploiting their weakness. And so sometimes circumstances bring a time of weakness into our life. And, and by that I mean sometimes mentally we become weak. Sometimes we physically or emotionally we become weak. And just because circumstances of life, bad things have happened, difficulties, oppositions, we're not sure how to deal with it, and it hurts. And that's the time when the enemy will be looking to take advantage. That's the time when we need to shelter under the wings of Almighty God, and we need to crawl in close to Jesus, and we need to listen to his voice, and we need to do what we know is right. His goal, our enemy's goal, is to provoke, to manipulate, and entice us to act against God. And then he has the opportunity to accuse us before God. So it's all about let's subvert Let's get him to fall. Let's get him to mess up. Let's get him away from God. Let's get him to, get him to act contrary to God. And then, look, God, look, 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 look. Hmm. He's the accuser of the brother. You say, you sure? Isn't that what he tried to do with Job? Yes. Isn't that what he tried to do with Jesus? Yes. When he tempted in the wilderness? Come on, just bow down and worship me and I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. Now, obviously that... That was a lost cause, but I mean, come on, we're, we're, we're easy targets compared to that. Don't think that he won't use every opportunity <coughs> to subvert <coughs> you and me. The goal is to try to remain strong. As Christians, we need to try to remain strong, robust, and healthy spiritually. Have a good affection for God. Have good communication with God so that he is our strength and he is our help. Arm yourself with the defenses that God outlined in Ephesians chapter 6. And then be sober and be vigilant. 
so that we can address that part of our struggle. I'm saying to you tonight, the things that we face, you know, family pink eye, uh, financial reversals, uh, I mean, all these things that we face, right? They're very real. I'm not saying they're not real. I'm not minimizing them at all. But what I'm saying is, those are exactly the times when our adversary will get in and pick at the wound and will we'll twist the broken limb and will try to cause pain and try to get us out of the way that he might accuse us before the Lord. Perhaps most of all, we need to support one another in prayer. We need to be, I mean, not just like, oh, God, pray for all the people in the church and may they have a good time today. <laughs> but sincerely supporting one another in prayer and encourage one another to stay strong and to stay on the right side. Just because, listen, if we sense that somebody is struggling, we don't, they don't need somebody to come in there all holier than thou and say, listen, I, as your spiritual older brother, and I love you now, and, you know, I've, I've let the church know because they need to know as a prayer request what's going on in your life, right? No, no, no. We need to encourage one another to stand strong, to stay in the right way, and, hey, I'm here with you. I hurt too sometimes, and I'm here, I'm, with, I'm in your corner. And let's not yield to sin. Amen. Let's not allow ourselves to be subverted away from God. Really, the, the main thing I want you to get from this message tonight, some of the ways he can exploit our, our weaknesses and things for sure, but let's not forget the spiritual component. Let's not forget. Somebody said to me not too long ago, you know, I spent some extra time in prayer this morning. And already I face the opposite. Yeah, because he does not want you to be strong. Mm -hmm. He does not want you to be bold. He doesn't want you to be confident. So stay in the way with God. Be strong. Pray for one another. Encourage one another. And resist the devil. And he will flee from you. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, I pray tonight. Lord, I can only imagine that perhaps before I get home tonight or tomorrow or sometime, Lord, soon... Opposition is going to come my way. Lord, I didn't mean to say any of this tonight with any kind of arrogance or superiority. Lord, I know I'm just as weak. Lord, I, I feel like just all the time there's something just around the corner. There's always some temptation. There's always some snare. There's always some thing just looking to trip us up and to, to get us off course. Lord, that's my experience. I know that happens, dear God. But Lord, it's, it's difficult to be sober and vigilant all the time and so we need your strength and we need your guidance and your protection God and we need to pray for one another and we need to do all that we can to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might that we might be able to stand against the adversary of the devil and God I pray that you'd give us the victory Lord that we might be victorious to be able to bring other people to Christ Lord, if we're just enmeshed in all of our own battles and just mired in our, in our own mediocrity and things, Lord, and we, we can't really be strong for other people. We can't bring other people to Christ because we're just trying to keep our head above water. Mm. So, God, I pray that you'd give us strength, Lord. I pray that you'd give us power. Help us to be content with the things of God and not go chasing after the things of the flesh and be fighting against God, but, Lord, to follow you and to love you and to trust you. I pray these things now in Jesus' name. Amen.